They not only sing good, they can bounce together in unison. It, uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, you know, you almost got to do some Irish jam dance or something. Jesus was a great teacher, and his favorite teaching method involved the use of stories, stories which we call parables. They are parables because they have a purpose, they have a message, they teach a lesson. Some of Jesus' parables are very familiar, and the two most famous and popular ones would be the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. It's the Prodigal Son I want us to reflect on this week and next week. Before we go any further, I want to make sure we understand what we are talking about when we refer to someone as being prodigal. According to the dictionary, prodigal means given to reckless extravagance, characterized by wasteful expenditure, lavish, yielding abundantly, luxuriant. The first two meanings are the ones we are dealing with this morning. So let's review the story and do some paraphrasing so we can more easily relate to it. A respected and successful man had two sons, two very different sons. The older son is dedicated and responsible, obedient and trustworthy, and has always worked hard on the family farm. The younger son is restless. The lifestyle he has known bores him to death. He wants out of there and is entranced by what he thinks it would be like to live in the city. Because the bright lights beckon him, he asks his father if he could make an early claim on his inheritance so he can stretch his wings and do his thing. The father, a generous man, perhaps an overly generous man, agrees, and before long the boy heads out for the destination that he has so long dreamed about. It takes no time at all for him to begin living in the fast lane. With his rather substantial wherewithal, he quickly finds friends who are more than willing to help him quickly spend his money. Money which, needless to say, is soon gone, along with these so-called friends. All of a sudden, he's got to scrape and struggle just to make ends meet. And seemingly overnight, they don't. Finally, in desperation, he's forced to take the only job that he can find, slopping hogs. Can you imagine anything worse for a first-century Jew caring for animals that his religion calls unclean? And as he works, he begins to envy them because their diet is better than his. He soon comes to his senses and plans, I'm going home. 
My father's servants live better than I do. Maybe he'll take me back. So home he trudges, weary, weak, threadbare, skinny, sick of body and sick of soul and sick of himself and sick of life. Can you just see him plodding along the road to the place in which he grew up? Of course you can. And so can his father, who, since we are told he sees him while he is yet a good way off, must be standing by the window, hoping that something like this is going to happen. The boy stumbles and struggles closer and struggle, closer and stro closer, while the father, with a cry of joy, rushes out to meet him. The boy begins his perhaps rehearsed apology, voicing his shame and asking for forgiveness, only to be interrupted by his father's explosive song of joy and love. Get some decent clothes, the best we've got for my son. Put some rings on his fingers and some shoes on his feet. Heat up the stove and prepare a feast, because we're going to have a party. I thought he was lost to me, but he has returned. It's time to celebrate. Wow. And it's here that so many of us, if we're really listening, and have perhaps gone through a similar experience, get kind of misty and smile with satisfaction. A happy ending. And we do so like a happy ending. But this isn't the ending. The other son, the older son, the son who has been such a good son, comes along, asks what's going on, and flips out with anger and indignation. You've got to be kidding. Here I've been all this time working my fingers to the bone, and you never gave me a party. I never hurt you so. I never wasted your money. I never left your side. But he gets the celebration. Now doesn't that beat all? The father tries to explain the depths of his love for his older son and that all that he possesses will one day be his. He tries to explain that his joy at the younger son's return does not excuse his actions, but is a reason for happiness nonetheless. He urges this angry man to join the party. And that's where the story ends. Jesus leaves us hanging. Does this son, cal does this son calm down? Does this son go in? We don't know. And I am not going to explore that issue any further today because that's part of the theme for next week's sermon. <laughs> Carrot. Hmm? For now, let's turn the parable, parable a bit on its head and consider it from the father's point of view. Up until now, we've mostly been concentrating on the prodigal son, have we not? And let's give this father a name. How about Zachariah? Well, Zach was a loving father, loving to the point of indulgence. His neighbors might have thought that he gave his sons too much for their own good. He probably made a mistake when he gave in to his younger son's request, and the boy was undoubtedly spoiled to have even asked for it. Indeed, the father catered to the boy's self-centeredness with this acquiescence, and it was what and it was what it was that I suspect, and it was what it was, and I suspect that he even erred on the side of kindness and generosity most of the time. Can't you just hear some of the conversations in town when friends and neighbors heard what was happening? Did you hear what old Zach did? He gave his kid his, his share of the family estate. That boy doesn't know his head from his elbow. And now he's gone, he's got all that money. Mark my words, it will do him no good. A week or two go by and the most recent happening again becomes the center of local gospel, gossip. Did you hear the latest about Zach and what that kid of his did? The boy took off and left home, just like that. Well, I'm not surprised, not surprised at all. I knew something like this would happen the minute I heard about the fool thing that Zach did. I told you it would turn out to be bad, didn't I? You remember me telling you that, don't you? More time passes. I was in the city last week, and who do you think I saw? That's right, Zach's boy. He was really living it up. He had a blonde on one arm and a brunette on the other. Both hotties, let me tell you. And he was three sheets to the wind in the morning. Now, I don't know much about clothes, but he sure didn't, sure didn't look like he bought the ones he was wearing at any discount store. You know what they say, a fool and his money are soon parted. Zach should have known better because this kid doesn't know anything. Zach's a great guy, a generous guy, as nice a fellow as you'd ever want to meet but sometimes he blows it where his boys are concerned. Then perhaps six months later, we hear the new report on the grapevine. Do you suppose Zach knows what's happened with his son? I mean, the trouble he's gotten into? The fool's apparently spent all his money, every cent of it, and just when the bottom's fallen out of the market, 
There's practically no work to be had anywhere. The boy looks like Skid Row Revisited, with barely enough rags to cover his hind end. So guess what he's doing? No, not even panhandling. He's feeding pigs. Poor Zach. He's tried so hard and been so good. Can someone love someone too much? Makes you wonder. Then one morning there is a different kind and final conversation. Hear the good news about Zach and that younger son of his? He came home. They say you could hear the orchestra halfway into town that night. What a celebration. The boy looks like a skeleton, but he's back and Zach's sure happy. It wasn't all good though. Just when the party was getting going, the older boy came in from the fields and wanted to know what was happening. Boy, did he get ticked off. Refused to go in. Zach was pleading with him to understand and participate. The guy looked stubborn as a mule. They argued and argued back and forth. Folks didn't want to appear to be eavesdropping, so they left and didn't find out how it ended. Those boys never did like one another even a whole lot. Too different, I suppose, and both way different than Zach. The one not enough responsibility, the other not enough kindness. Makes you wonder why they turned out like they did. It's not as if Zach hasn't tried. It's not as if Zach hasn't shown them all the love in the world. How could this happen? You well might wonder. Here we've got Zach, an incredibly loving father, apparently an unconditionally loving father. Perfect? No. In fact, he seems to have really messed up in giving his younger son all that he asked for, despite probably knowing that the young man was going to blow it. But Zach took a chance, hoping against hope that all would turn out to be all right. And what about the boy himself? How could he be so selfish, so obtuse, so uncaring? Did he at any point think about his father's feelings? I guess not. He did what he did and got what he wanted, and the devil take the hindmost. Of course, life eventually painfully awakened him to reality, and he came to his senses, but by then the damage had already been done, and the healing of his relationship with his father did not appear to be a sure thing. And what about the other son? The good son. It appears that despite his loyalty and devotion to his father, he could not get beyond his own self-centeredness and rejoice with his father in this time of celebration. All he could think about was that he had never been given such a party. So we've got two sons upon whom this father lavished love, but neither of whom demonstrated an attempt to emulate who and what their father was. A slogan often seen on Sunday school walls declares that children become like what they live with. Let them with, live with anger and they grow up to be angry people. Let them live with love and they grow up to be loving people. The odds would suggest that such a slogan is usually right. And a betting person would take a chance that love produces love and hate produces hate. But the lesson from our parable would offer that love does not always win. Why not? Well, even love is never a sure thing. Some who grow up with love become spoiled and insistent and demanding, perhaps because those who love them give them too much in order to demonstrate their love. And even in relationships, loves can lead to one partner exploiting the other partner's good nature and loving ways. Love can lead to enabling, which seems to be a good and loving thing to do, but is counterproductive in the long run. So love is risky, but the answer is not to not love and thereby, thereby not take the risk. The answer rests in trying to determine how best to show one's love and hope for the best, realizing that the results might not always come quickly or be all that one desires. After all, we are talking here about the actions and reactions of human beings, those most unpredictable of all creatures. And with love, we depend upon the response of the other person, which is always a gamble. Yet according to the teachings of our faith, that seems to be the way God has chosen to relate to our world. In terms of our parable, the father represents God. And look at how his sons, who represent us, return his love. How does God feel about that kind of human response, the kind he so often gets to his love? The Old Testament prophets Jeremiah and Hosea portray God agonizing over the way humanity so often acts despite what he, God, has done for them. And in the New Testament we find, according to Matthew, Jesus in his last days weeping over Jerusalem with, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. 
Writer Philip Yancey once spent two weeks alone in a mountain cabin reading the Bible from cover to cover, twice. And when he was done, he concluded that the Bible was primarily the story of God presented as a jilted lover while wondering why the God who made the universe would put up with such humiliation and treatment from his human creation. However, Jesus went on loving. God goes on loving. So maybe it's surprising that, considering how much love depends upon such gentle and uncontrolling methods, it ever works. And yet its success record is remarkably high. Also, it seems to be the method chosen by God in terms of his dealings with us. So that alone should tell us that it's certainly worth trying. More often than not, patience here is a necessity. If love doesn't seem to win now, wait. Perhaps it will win down the road. That's what happened for the father in our parable. He looked and looked, waited and waited, and in this case, love triumphed. That is what happens over and over for people who do all they can until they can do no more, realizing that the ball is in the other person's court, and wait, with at least sometimes, but with no guarantees, a happy ending. And even when such a happy ending does not occur, at least those doing the loving are true to themselves, and can rest in the knowledge that they have given their all. Yes, love is risky. Love is chancy. But nobody becomes a full and complete human being without love. So if God loves us unconditionally, how do we respond to that love? Are we like the prodigal son who left and selfishly take advantage of God's affection and generosity and do our own thing? Are we like the prodigal son who stayed and sullenly take advantage of God's affection and generosity and with an attitude of entitlement, complain and criticize if everything doesn't go our way. And how do we in our own lives reflect the love of God by loving others? It may not always be smart to love to a fault, but it's sure better than not loving at all. Love may not always win, but most of the time it wins magnificently.